When I'm going through all this, these data points on the specs, I'm thinking, okay, I know the John Deere's more, so give me more for my money, right? And we're already starting with less because it's less horsepower, less PTO horsepower than the Kubota, but it costs more. So um, just going through how I look at this. I am thinking of selling my Kubota M4 and not because I don't like it, not because I think it's a good idea, but because I'm just getting that itch. And so my brother thinks I'm an idiot for doing that, and I probably am. We've gone through this whole kind of thing before where I have a tractor all dialed in the way that I want, and then I get the itch to buy something different, and then I regret it. So maybe I get something new, hang on to this one, and then if I don't like the new one, I sell the new one and still have this one there, and. Um, can go back to my, my fallback option there, but I want to get something bigger. Not because I need something bigger, but because I want something bigger. And so I'm in a unique situation compared to most people where I use a tractor to make videos to sell tractor attachments. And I've shown this one for a couple of years and all sorts of tools on it. And I just feel like maybe it's time for something fresh, show you guys something different. And uh, I'm thinking about the Kubota M5 series, all right, so a step bigger than this guy. This is the Kubota M4 D071, going to an M5 111, or the comparable, at least I think this is comparable, John Deere 5100E. So they make a 5100M, I think a 5100R. The price points just keep going up, but anyway, uh, the 5100E is what I'm looking at as well. I was considering Coyote too, but there's just really nothing in the used market out there. I mean, very, very hard to find um, the volume. It just isn't there. So anyway, I've narrowed it down to the Kubota and the John Deere. Now, what I found is probably the coolest Kubota M5 111 that I could have ever found. And so this is a problem for me because I want to buy it. So talk me off of a ledge if you would. So we'll show the listing pictures up there. <laughs> yeah. So this is a unique one, all right? Now it does come with about a $50,000 premium for all I can see being tracks instead of wheels and black paint. It looks pretty amazing, I wanna get it. And uh, being again in my unique situation where this is totally impractical, I can see potentially that $50,000 increase drawing in more eyeballs now with all the videos that I have, all the content I put out there, would I end up seeing a return on that additional $50,000 in, you know, an advertising spend, basically? I have no idea. That's a big gamble, but this thing is really catching my attention. But a few questions, really, in my mind that are jumping out. Number one, where am I putting the rim guard in the rear tracks? I don't see a spot to put that. That could be a problem. On top of that, those got to be lighter than wheels in general. And, and some of these uh, bigger Kubotas have like cast iron plates in them. And of course you can add wheel weights in there on top of liquid ballast to get a lot of counterweight and be stable, which I'm big on. It just looks light in the back end. And, and maybe there's something, I don't know, maybe there's more to the story there, but you have a front end loader, which lifts a heck of a lot of weight, about 4,000 pounds of weight. All right. So you need a lot of weight on the rear end to offset that. And also, what kind of a load do those front tracks, what can they take? You know, I mean, 4,000 pounds, that's the full height. It lifts, I don't know, five, 6,000 pounds if you're just getting it off the ground. So that is a heck of a lot of force to put on those front tracks. Are they really designed to support that? So I'm kind of torn on this one, guys. I don't know. I'm probably, well, I want to say I'm not going to do it, but don't be surprised if I do it. All right. So Talk me out of it, talk me into it, I don't know. I, I don't know if this is the kind of thing that'll be for sale for a long time, or if there's some other crazy fool like me out there who's like, I gotta have it. I would just hate to get it and find out it's like really unusable for what I wanna use it for. Where are they at? They're in, they're in Tennessee. Maybe this, maybe this requires a GWT business trip down south to give this thing a test drive. I don't know. The weather is starting to get chilly up here. Get some warmer weather down there. Anyway, I want to take you through my high level decision-making process on 
deciding between, well, I've already decided, I think, unless I found, unless I found an absolute screaming deal, there's always exceptions to every rule. If I found an absolute screaming deal on something that could always change my mind, but I'm going to take you through my decision-making process when I've been looking at the M5 and the 5100E and then let you know where I landed on the one that I decided that I really want to narrow down and go with. But again, when I'm shopping in the used market, if I see something that's almost too good to be true, well, all bets are off the table then. So anyway, Kubota M5 versus 5100E. Now I'm looking at the M5-111. They also make an M5-091. The specs are very, very similar between both of those models. And so besides the engine horsepower and the PTO horsepower, but like weight, loader, three-point capacity, tires, all that kind of stuff are all, hydraulic system, I think, are all the same. Um, so you could interchange it if you wanted to. The Kubota has about 105, 106 horsepower. The 5100E has 100 horsepower. So it's about as, it's a little bit closer of a comparison than the N, than the M5091. Why do I want to get attracted to this big? Just for the heck of it. I really don't even need a front end loader. I use the front end loader for forks on here, but I do have a, I sort of have a skid steer. The JCB doesn't work right now. I don't even have it here. It's been in the JCB. I've been out without my JCB skid steer for three weeks now, maybe more than that. Still not repaired. The loader doesn't lift. It's got 31 hours. So um, I'm going to get a 333G. So I'll have a huge loader is my point with front end loader capability. So I don't necessarily need a loader on the big tractor that I get. So I would consider a loaderless one, which would give me an opportunity to put an HLA snow wing. I wanted to try one of those frame mounted snow wings for a long time. You can get the snow wings for the loaders, for the skid steers too. I may go that route, but I'm just hemming and hawing on what I would do. The primary tasks that I use this Kubota for and that I would use the next one for are for um, driveway maintenance, uh, snow blower on the back or you know, plow or something, or um, a rear blade, something like that in the back for snow removal. Um, mowing ditch banks, I put a big ditch bank mower on there or mowing like the, uh, the industrial park that we have. Um, nobody, that hasn't been mowed besides when I mowed it this year, so nobody else is doing that apparently. Uh, all the food plot stuff like planting corn, uh, discing, tilling, yada, yada, yada. A lot of these tools would need to be bigger than I've ever shown before. And so it would give me an opportunity to show some bigger, heavier duty stuff, which is honestly a smaller market. I sell a lot more stuff for subcompacts and small compacts, but it would just be something different and fun. And there's, there's not a lot of really good content out there that I found. So it would help folks make easier decisions when they are shopping for tractor tools that size. All right, so I'm going to trusty tractor data, and I did also bounce a couple things off of the OEM websites, Kubota and Deere's websites, too, uh, just to verify some of this information. But uh, PTO horsepower is something I was interested in. Again, planning on using some bigger attachments. I want to make sure I'm not borderline on that, that I'm right in the wheelhouse. And the Kubota had, well, the Kubota has a little bit more information. So they've got a claimed PTO horsepower, which you'll see on tractor data. And then they also have a tested. So that's nice when you have that. And the claimed PTO is 89. So that's like what Kubota is publishing. But when it was actually tested, it tested at basically 98 uh, PTO horsepower, which is a lot. That's a lot more too. Um, the John Deere had 85 claimed. They don't have a tested on there, but if we assume that that goes up by eight even, it's still below um, the Kubota. So, and it should make sense. The Kubota has a bit more, it has a few more ponies in the engine too. So. I, I think I already know this information, so it's probably worth sharing with you. The John Deere, from my research, what I can find, the John Deere brand new pricing is a little bit higher, not a lot, but a little bit higher than the Kubota, all right? So I, when I'm going through all this, these data points on the specs, I'm thinking, okay, I know the John Deere's more, so give me more for my money, right? And we're already starting with less because it's less horsepower, less PTO horsepower, than the Kubota, but it costs more. So um, just going through how I look at this, right? So anyway, uh, fuel capacity, 30 horsepower on the deer. I think it was 27, 28 on the, uh, on the Kubota. Oh, 
Uh, going through fuel capacity, gonna be 28 horsepower on the Kubota, 30. Okay, going through fuel capacity, 28 gallons, not horsepower. 28 gallons of fuel. I don't know how many horsepower in a gallon, but there's 30 gallons of fuel in the tank on the John Deere. So I don't, unless that was like 20 versus 30, I go through a lot of fuel on here. You know, it would have been had to had to be a big delta for me to be concerned about that. But we're going to get to what I think, this is when my mind was made up right here on this next data point. There's more that are also impressive, but this one alone, <laughs> and I'm only going through this in how it's listed on tractor data. This is mind blowing. Okay. So the Kubota has two options for three point lift capacity. And when they're measuring this, use the measurement that's 24 inches out from the end of the arm. So your three point arm ends here. They do a load test. That's like if you had an attachment on the back that's two foot out beyond that because that's realistic. And I like using that, that data point. So they've got two options. They must have an upgrade available, but I'm gonna use round numbers. The lower option is 5,200 pounds that it'll lift on the three point. 5,200 pounds on the three point. That's the lowest one. The, the higher option is 7,300 pounds, all right? I mean, that is that could almost lift this entire tractor off the ground right here. That's insane. So now I want you to sit down for the John Deere. Same thing, 24 inches out from the end of those three-point arms. 3,200 pounds. <laughs> That's their only option. 3,200 pounds versus 5,200 pounds or 7,300 pounds. So 2,000 pounds less on that John Deere. I can't even believe that number is accurate. It's just, it's so incredibly low for a tractor that size that I would be embarrassed as a salesman to repeat that number. Uh, there's honestly no excuse. Now I know the 5M, you can upgrade the three point. I think the, the 5M gives you some additional upgrades and you're paying for that. When you go from a 5E to a 5M, you are paying a lot more for those tractors. So I, I, it's not even the same category in my opinion. Anyway, so my mind was made up right there as give me a break, John Deere. Okay, so this one here, they've got a weight range. They always do weight ranges, but that's because there's different configurations, open stations and cabs. Certain models will have two-wheel drive and four-wheel drive, and they're all gonna have different weights. So if you're getting a four-wheel drive cab tractor, you can always, it's pretty safe to assume you're getting the heaviest configuration. Um, and so that's what I'm using in this comparison. So the Kubota weighs 7,700 pounds. The Deere weigh, weighs, 8150. So, I mean, round up to 8200, I guess, if you want. So, the deer is heavier by seven, what was it? By 500 pounds. Okay. So, that's a win for the deer over the Kubota, which is kind of surprising. Um, but the good thing is, unless, I, well, unless I get the machine with tracks, I can put a lot of liquid ballast in the rear tires and make up a lot of weight that way and put wheel weights on there and, and still have a ton of ballast weight if I need it. All right. Moving on to the engine size. Um, Again, this is where John Deere is beating Kubota, all right? So both four-cylinder engines on there, both made by the OEM. So Kubota makes their engine, John Deere makes their engine. I think that's a good thing. They're both known to be very high-quality engines, and I don't think that uh, engine reliability and performance would be an issue with either one of these. Um, 230 cubic inch on the Kubota, uh, and it was uh, 270 six cubic inch on the deer. So that's a, a four, or four, four uh, we could do this a different way. 3.8 liter versus 4.5 liter too. So that's a pretty significant difference. Although, does that mean that the Kubota is more efficient? It's drawing 105, 106 horsepower out of a smaller engine. They give two different rated RPMs. The open station runs at 2,400. The cab runs at 2,600 RPMs. The deer runs at 2,500 RPM. So RPMs are fairly comparable depending on if you're open station or cab. Now there's guys out there that know way more about engines than me. Um, and so you guys can chime in on that on, on what your thoughts are. I'd, I'd be curious to know and, and learn a little bit there myself too. So transmissions, they're both gonna have similar power reverse, power shuttle, hydraulic shuttle type transmissions. Some of the Kubotas I've been looking at 
have the clutchless version and some of them don't. So I, there must be some other option. Like this Kubota M4 has a clutchless um, shuttle where you can just push a button and that engages the clutch and then you can shift the gear on the fly. Pretty sweet. Um, some of them don't though. They're just, you have to push in the clutch and then change your gear. So there's, there's a couple variations. Deer doesn't have that as far as I know. And why, the, why, this, why this next data point didn't matter as much to me is because I don't, I haven't necessarily decided I'm going to get a loader. If, I find, if the one I find has a loader on it and that's what I perceive as the best value, then great, I'll get it. But it's still worth knowing the loader specs on there and, and what to expect out of that. Oh, actually this one, tractor data didn't have the, uh, the, the, the lift height. So I'm, let me go to tractor or to the Kubota website and pull that up because this is interesting, all right? And so Kubota loaders have <clears throat> two positions. I don't know if any of the deer loaders do. I don't think the 520M loader does, but there's, there's a power position and then there's like a max height position, all right? And I believe that's just with this adjustment right here. And so uh, I don't know which position this is in. I don't, I don't remember, I haven't messed with it because I don't, I don't care. It's not enough of a, a worry for me. But if you lift higher, like it maybe is a foot higher lift or something, but it'll lift less weight. But if you need to max out the amount of power or weight that you can lift, then it'll lift more weight, but it'll lift it lower. So I'm gonna give you the, um, the highest lift comparison here. We can follow it up with the power position, but the Kubota will lift 145.7 inches or a little bit over 12 foot high at the pin. All right, these are, these are max specs. All right, so at the pin, 146 inches, a little over 12 foot, and it'll lift basically 4,000 pounds, 3,990 pounds to over 12 foot high. The John Deere 520M loader will lift 132 inches high, all right? So 11 feet up at the pin, and it'll lift 3,523 pounds. So ballpark of 500 pounds less, 400, 450 pounds less than the Kubota, and it's lifting it a foot lower as well. So using that 11 foot height, that's what Kubota's power position is, all right? So if you left it in the power position, the Kubota loader can lift to 11 foot high, 132 inches, and doing so, it will lift 4,144 pounds, all right? So you're over 600 pounds more lifting it to the same height compared to the deer, or about 20% more than the deer. That's a lot. So I think those are really the, the big highlights that I was looking at because I'm, I'm looking at, I know that the engines are going to be good. I know that both tractors are reliable, but what I want to use them for, right? I'm using the three-point hitch for sure. I may be using the loader, the hydraulic system. You know, if I'm hooking up certain attachments to it and want to run it. I didn't talk about the hydraulic system. I skipped right over that. Did I skip over the hydraulic system? Oh, man. I talked about it in my head. I looked at it like five times. Let's talk about the hydraulic system. I don't think there was much to talk about there, though. Maybe that's why I skipped over it. And I had to go, I had to bounce this off of Kubota's website too. Tractor Data had only part, well, eh. Tractor Data had some information on there. So hydraulic system. Now you got to pay attention because these numbers can be, you got to know what you're, you're looking at. This is where cross-referencing makes sense because you'll see total hydraulic flow. Sometimes you'll just see hydraulic flow. Sometimes you'll see steering flow. You'll see uh, three-point flow or, or whatever. So Kubota has, for their cab, has 17 GPMs. It says for cab pump flow. And then it says for cab steering flow, 6.1. So you add those numbers up and you have a total flow of 23.1 GPM. That's pretty good. So deer, it's broken out a little bit differently, but they, their total flow right on here is 22 and a half. All right, so it's slightly lower. Uh, it lists an SCV flow of 15.9. So that's again, slightly lower, about a GPM lower than the, uh, the cabbed Kubota. So those are both pretty solid, um, but all those numbers are low compared to a, well, a 333G high flow skid steer, right? That does cost, uh, honestly, not that much more. You, a comparable used one is maybe 10, 15 grand more than uh, one of these tractors. And you're getting 
around 40 GPMs on a high flow skid steer. All right, so on, on their best days, they're about half on, on one of those tractors. All right, so that's a tractors just aren't designed for hydraulic flow like skid steers are. They're just they're made to made to use the PTO, you know, with the gear drive. Um, systems on there and and you can operate attachments they cost a lot less they're they're, they're simpler uh, to work on and replace and repair if you need to so a lot of benefits to that but a little bit of a tangent there so i'm thinking you can probably guess what direction i'm leaning towards right now which is the kubota m5 111 i, I just in the used market the price points are pretty comparable i mean you're gonna see some higher and lower and it's tough right because they're all set up one has two remotes one has three um, you know, use hours, some have 100, some have 500, some have 300, the year, the model year, what warranties left, little things here and there, right? So it's tough to, you can't do an apples to apples exactly, but you can get pretty close. And use prices are roughly the same. I mean, the deers are slightly more, makes sense, but really it's pretty marginal uh, as far as that goes. But Chris brought up a question. I've talked about how it can be really hard to sell a tractor that doesn't have a front end loader on it. And I agree, that is very true. Or if you think you're gonna buy a tractor that doesn't have a loader on there and then just go find one in the used market, that's a lot easier said than done. I also think that's very applicable to the compact tractors. I think once you start to get up into tractors bigger than this, you know, you get into the more of the farm type tractors and Number one, I think lots of outfits and operations are gonna have more than one machine. They probably have a telehandler or a skid steer or some other piece of equipment with a big old loader on it anyways. And you see a ton of tractors that size without loaders on them. And I, I think that kind of tells a story right there. Um, but two, it also let me, on top of that snow wing that we could put on the front, give me an opportunity. We sell a lot of suitcase weights, right? But it would just get, I don't run any suitcase weights on the front of tractors because they all have loaders. And so <laughs> I can put a weight bracket on on this and uh, just stack it up with, with suitcase weights on the front of the tractor too and just highlight that. Again, just when customers visually see stuff in videos over and over, it lets them know, oh, hey, maybe I need that for my tractor. So um, just another unique angle and potential opportunity there for, for it to be put out there in videos. Now, you can use this. I thought it'd be helpful, right? Because I'm looking at making this decision and purchasing an actual tractor. So it's a big decision for me. It's a lot of money to spend. You can use the same concept, the same application. It doesn't, doesn't matter what brand. It could be Coyote. It could be LS, Mahindra, TYM, whatever it is. And if you're comparing between a couple of different ones, five different ones, right? You know, just line them all up and, and find the, the data points that are important to you and make a little chart, just a little spreadsheet, right? And just write, here's the hydraulic flow, here's the lift capacity, here's, you know, maybe mid PTO, maybe you wanna run a front mount, front mount snow blower on there and you need to have something with a mid PTO so you can run a front mount blower on there. You know, maybe that's an important criteria to you. So you can do this with a subcompact, you can do it with a compact or utility tractor, whatever it is, but that's how I go through it. Um, and in some ways, when folks are looking for tractors from me, I ask a whole series of questions and that helps me eliminate 90% of the tractors and narrow down on the right tractors for them. So uh, just another way to look at it. And I thought it'd be helpful to show you how I go through the process. And if you're not sure where to start or you're just lost in all the data, you got to start somewhere. This is a really good place to start because it can help you. It can help you find what is the best value. And of course, that's not all that goes into it. There's dealer support that is huge and I'm gonna be frank, all dealers are still struggling. So uh, we had a tractor that came in that's under powertrain warranty, but it's got a, a, a hose leak on it and I want it to be taken care of under warranty before we sell it because it's got warranty, so I don't wanna pay for it. <clears throat> we talked, we got two John Deere dealers around here. One of them was a month out just to get it in. The other one was two months out to get it in. So one or two months just to get your tractor in and looked at. And it's always, I don't care what time of year it is, it's always, well, we're busy for this reason or we're busy for this reason. And it doesn't really seem to matter. That's just the way that it is anymore. And I'm not picking on deer, it's just an example. I mean, I could use a, make cases about the whole JCB debacle you guys have heard about. I could talk about Kubota. I could talk about the Polaris Ranger saga that I had a long time ago. I mean, I could, I could tell you about all sorts of things. So. Um, it's kind of across the board where it doesn't really seem what manufacturer it is. And, and 
that's in my neck of the woods. Maybe your neck of the woods is different. I still think how a dealer treats you, even if they are backed up though, if they um, do it with the right attitude, you know, if they are looking to support you and not just say, well, tough luck, Chuck. You know, I, I still think that there's a, a demeanor and a way about uh, going about your business that can give you a sense of confidence, at least that they, they're capable, they're going to take care of you, they're doing what they can uh, and, and go from there. So that's always subject to your area your circumstances and everything else. So anyway, if you're in the market for a tractor, we'd love to help you out. If you're in the market for a tractor attachment for the front end loader or the three point hitch, we can help with that too. We ship tractors, tractor attachments nationwide every day of the week. If you don't know what you need, we have a lot of comparisons. We show all these tools in action on a lot of different tractors so you can see how it works. Sometimes how it doesn't work because we show that too. Go to goodworkstractors.com. I want to thank you for taking time out of your day to stop by. And until next time, stay safe. We'll see you soon. Oh,